What's happening in the United States right now? Since the beginning of this year, US aviation have been rocked by a number of quite worrying close calls and that have caused a lot of people to ask questions about the country's overall aviation safety. How did the controllers not see that? That's going to be the, one of the main questions that the NTSB is going to want to find out. But is there really a problem here? And if so, is it a new one? Stay tuned. If you've been following the news during the past few weeks and months, you have likely seen reports of several serious aviation incidents in the United States. The first of them happened at JFK on the 13th of January, where a Delta Airlines Boeing 737 was on its takeoff roll when an American Airlines 777 unexpectedly crossed the runway just in front of them. Now, this incident is still being investigated, that's why I haven't featured it yet over on the Mentor Pilot channel, but it appears that the American Airlines crew believed that they had been cleared to cross runway 04 left on their way to depart from runway 31 left. Now, what had actually happened was that the controller had cleared them to make a right turn and cross runway 31 left to taxi for departure using 04 left. The controller fortunately realized what was happening and immediately cancelled the takeoff clearance for the Delta 737. The pilots rejected, stopping about 330 meters or 1000 feet short of the taxiway where the 777 was crossing. The 737 returned to the terminal after the event, likely to check and probably cool down the brakes, while the 777 departed about an hour later, unfortunately overwriting the cockpit voice recorder by doing so. Now, there is much more to this story, but we will have to wait for the NTSB's final report in order to cover it thoroughly. The next eye-catching incident happened on the 4th of February in Austin, Texas. On this occasion, a Southwest Boeing 737-700 was cleared for takeoff on runway 18 left, while a FedEx 767 was cleared to land on that same runway in low visibility conditions. The controller did apparently expect that the Southwest flight would be able to depart well before the landing of the FedEx 767. Again, we won't know the full details of this incident until the NTSB publishes its final report, but as the preliminary report explains, the 767 was just 0.7 miles short of the runway threshold when the Southwest flight finally started rolling for takeoff. The FedEx crew ultimately decided to go around when they became visual and saw the 737 in front of them. They then also transmitted Southwest abort on the radio, saying that they were going around above them. The Southwest crew later explained that they were somewhere between 80 knots and V1 at that time and instead decided to continue as that was perceived as the safer option. But the result then became that the FedEx 767 overflew the 737 that was departing. The NTSB is still analyzing the ground tracks to determine just how close the two aircraft came to each other, but they eventually diverged with the Southwest aircraft continuing to its destination and the FedEx 767 landing safely after another approach. Then, about one week later, the Air Current published its report on an incident that had happened in Hawaii on the 18th of December last year, which had previously gone unnoticed, at least by the general public. In this case, the involved aircraft was a United Airlines Boeing 777, which was departing from Kaului Airport heading for San Francisco. After reaching around 2,200 feet of its initial climb, the aircraft entered a dive down towards the water below. According to ADSB data, the Boeing 777 momentarily reached a descent rate close to 8,000 feet per minute until it resumed its climb again, 775 feet above the sea. This incident happened in very rough weather on the same day that a Hawaiian Airlines flight bound for Honolulu suffered 36 injuries due to turbulence in the same area. After their dive, the United crew resumed their climb and finally reached their destination without any further incident. It is not clear if air traffic control was aware of what had happened, but United later confirmed that the pilots had filed a formal internal safety report with their airline and notified the FAA. It appears that the NTSB wasn't notified at the time about the incident, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything since the FAA was aware. A number of other incidents has since followed these ones. In total, different media outlets have identified seven recent incidents, of which most are runway incursions like the one that happened in JFK. The FAA acting administrator Billy Nolan and others in the agency have since acknowledged that they have seen a rise in high-profile incidents. Are we missing anything? Is there anything that we should be doing different? 
It also didn't help that the FAA recently issued a ground stop for all US flights because of a failure in the NOTAM system, which I covered in a recent video. All of these events combined will obviously draw the wrong kind of attention to the industry and probably also make a lot of people quite nervous. So what's going on? Is the aviation industry in the United States in some sort of crisis because the FAA has been relaxing standards? Or does it have to do with woke pilots, as some commentators on the right wing have been saying? Well, I will be examining that after this. I would like to talk to you about something that's really very personal and important to me, which is my overall health. I've been using AG1, today's sponsor, for a while now, and it's a comprehensive supplement that's packed with all of the vitamins and minerals that you need in order to stay healthy and strong. Their main product, AG1, gives you your daily need of nutrients and it impacts everything from sleep, digestion, energy, mood, immunity, to the health of your hair, skin and nails. And the best part is that it's super easy to take. All you have to do is to mix it with water and you're good to go, which is why I take it for breakfast, especially when I'm on the go. AG1 contains immune-supporting vitamin D3K2, and since I spend a lot of time indoors and inside of flights, I know how important it is to get enough vitamin D, and it's just nice to know that I'm getting what I need, especially when I'm traveling. So if you are someone who cares about your health and wants to make sure that you're getting all of the nutrients that you need, I highly recommend AG1. If you click on my link below, which is athleticgreens.com slash mentor now, you'll get a one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3K2 plus five travel packs for free with your first purchase. And you're also supporting my channel. Trust me, you can't put a price on your own health. So click on the link and get started today. Now, before we take a closer look at these incidents and what's being done about them, I need to make one thing absolutely clear. No rules around the hiring of pilots in the United States nor anywhere else in the world have been relaxed. I see a lot of comments in other videos and on social media where people seem convinced that this is happening due to some murky politic agenda, but that simply isn't the case. The closest the FAA came to making such a change was last year when a regional carrier, Republic Airways, requested a change that would have allowed them to hire new pilots with only 750 hours instead of the current 1,500 hours experience requirement. This would have come with some strings attached and would involve pilots having to go through a dedicated airline pilot training pipeline similar to what we have been doing successfully for decades in Europe and in the rest of the world. Republic flies regional aircraft and routes for American, Delta and United. Now, I have done a detailed video about what I think about the US 1500 hour rule, but in short, I think that it doesn't make much sense at all. But in this case, it really doesn't matter because back in September last year, the FAA rejected Republic's proposal and that was the end of that, kind of. It's also worth pointing out something else here before we start making assumptions about the pilot's background or their experience or inexperience. And that is, we don't really know what kind of experience level the pilots that were involved in these incidents actually had. And that's because the NTSB's final report have not been issued. This is actually one of the reasons why it is so important to leave making assumptions until the final report, which is unbiased and detailed, have been issued. But again, what we can say for absolutely sure, even before getting the final report, is that this hasn't been caused by any relaxing of rules or hiring practices. Airlines might have targets in hiring policies, but the overarching requirement is always that the pilots who are hired needs to fulfill the competency requirements first. No pilots will be hired if they don't fulfill those, period. The next question then becomes whether or not these incidents are actually that unusual and if they are rising in numbers. Or could it be that people are simply paying more attention to them right now? And this is actually where things start to get really interesting. Unfortunately, comparing statistics involving close calls is generally quite difficult because a lot of these events often go unreported and sometimes they don't trigger an investigation even if they are reported. For example, in the list of those seven recent incidents that I mentioned, two involve aircraft that were being pushed back or under tow when they bumped into another parked jet. 
Now, these are costly mistakes that no one likes to see, but they don't really speak of a problem in training of pilots or air traffic controllers, nor do they point to any real safety concern unless those bumps aren't noticed, of course. To be clear here, I am not suggesting that some of these recent aviation mishaps in the US aren't serious. Many of them absolutely are, and tragically, we also had one fatality when on the 1st of January this year, a ramp agent was ingested into the number one engine of an Envoy Air Embraer 175. Personally, I am really disappointed that many news reports about recent worrying events didn't seem to include that one, which I think poses a real problem, which is safety on the ramp. And I also don't like that some other slightly older but still recent incident doesn't appear to be investigated, even though they certainly look like they should be. For example, on the 7th of August 2021, a controller at Newark Liberty International Airport instructed that Turkish Airlines Airbus A330 to reject its takeoff because it was accelerating down a taxiway, not the runway. The A330 had reached a ground speed of around 90 knots barreling down the taxiway before rejecting. It then spent about one hour on the ground before taking off again for an uneventful long-haul flight towards its destination. That's something that I definitely would have expected a full-blown report about, but nothing seems to be happening around that one. A few months before that, on November the 15th, 2020, a sudden air Boeing 777 that had just taken off from JFK briefly got into a stick shaker event as it climbed through 5,000 feet. We know this because the pilot monitoring was reading back a climb clearance at the same time, but interrupted himself to say, stall, 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 stall to the other pilot. Fortunately, the crew of this Boeing 777 seems to have caught this problem early and only lost about 300 feet in the event, unlike the United 777 in Hawaii, which lost nearly 1,500 feet and was much lower to begin with. But again, we don't really know if these events are comparable because as far as we know, this 777 stall over JFK is not being investigated either. So, Going back to the question, are these recent incidents unusual or do people now notice them more readily? Well, the answer here is probably both. Having such incidents happen this frequently is not common, nor is it acceptable. It does seem like every couple of weeks you guys are investigating another close call. But it is also true that after the first two or three, and with the public already unhappy with the FAA over the NOTAM stoppage, it's very likely that the, the press is now covering every incident that happens with a far bigger interest than they normally would. Incidents. However, that's probably a good thing. We don't want incidents or accidents going unnoticed. That's actually part of the work that I'm doing over on the Mentor Pilot channel. So let's now look at what's being done about this. In March, the FAA Acting Administrator Billy Nolan convened a safety summit, inviting the airlines, airports, unions and others to look at these and other recent events and discuss what they could do about it. Afterwards, the agency released several statements outlining the areas where the FAA and its partners will be looking for answers and what they are recommending to do. Basically, <laughs> they will be looking everywhere. In terms of commercial operations, they're looking into ways to improve the methods and procedures that airlines use to share safety information with each other and with the authorities, as well as ways to analyze it. They will also look closely at stress in the workplace affecting both pilots and cabin crew as they examine the human factors part of this and what could be further improved in that area. In terms of air traffic control, the FAA is looking at any underlying factors and remedies for incursions and see how new technologies might help the controllers to avoid them. This could be by improving on the capabilities of existing surface surveillance systems, for example, or changes in rules and regulations as well as training. One thing that the FAA could look into is whether or not issuing a clearance to cross a runway several minutes before the aircraft actually reaches that runway has been a factor in these recent incursion events. Other teams are looking at airport and ground operations, again, an often really overlooked area, so I'm happy to hear that. During the pandemic, people working on the ramp didn't enjoy the same employment protections that eventually helped US airline pilots and flight attendants. This led to workforce attrition, so the concern here is that valuable experience is getting lost quickly and that this loss of experience could also be a factor here. 
There are also long-standing concerns about general aviation, which unfortunately has always had a much higher accident rate than airline and other commercial operations have had, for a variety of different reasons. So, this all sounds good, everyone needs to be more vigilant, but have the FAA actually issued any real guidance as a result of this? Well, actually yes, they have. The FAA identified air traffic control as a key factor in a number of these incidents and will be working on several ways to address this. One example is that the FAA is cutting the airline's minimum number of slots or flights that they have to perform at all New York area airports and at Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport in order for the airlines to be able to keep their slots. Normally, airlines have to operate at least 80% of their allocated slots from busy airports like these or risk losing them. Delta and United Airlines have recently requested to temporarily return 10% of their slots at these airports, but without losing them. Now, the authorities rarely grant these kind of requests, since they tend to really piss off competitor airlines who would love to get their hands on those slots instead. But the FAA agreed this time, citing that air traffic controller staffing levels was the reason for them actually approving it. But it is not just air traffic control that is getting some much needed love in the aftermath of these incidents. Another direct effect could involve rules regarding one of the aircraft's black boxes or the cockpit voice recorder. And this is something that many in the industry, including myself, have been calling for for a long period now. Because right now, cockpit voice recorders must be able to record at least two hours of sound from the cockpit, including the pilots, ambient sound and radio communications. Now, CVRs, or cockpit voice recorders, record this stuff on a solid state media. That's basically a more rugged version of what we today know as SSDs. Before the solid state media, the CVR were recording on magnetic tapes, which meant that they could only hold around 30 minutes of sound. So when the solid state memories were introduced and saved sound could be extended to about two hours, it seemed like a massive improvement, which it of course also was. Two hours would easily cover most of the critical communications and decisions that the pilots would have taken prior to any accident. But there is a problem with this two hour capacity when it comes to these recent incidents. Unlike what happens with accidents and other emergencies, after an incident like this, one or both aircraft might still continue to operate for a quite long time. And by the time that the flight is finished, the two hours have long passed, and that means that the conversations and other audio covering the incident has been overwritten. This creates a real headache for the investigators who lose access to this crucial information and we recently saw that it can also generate a lot of unnecessary friction with the involved crews. After the JFK close call in January, the NTSB wanted to interview the pilots of the American Airlines 777 who had crossed the active runway without clearance. But it appears that these pilots initially objected to doing these interviews because of the NTSB's insistence on recording them. The NTSB later clarified that the reason they wanted to record the interviews rather than to use a stenographer or simply just rely on written statements was because no cockpit voice recordings of the crew were available since the crew had taken off for their long haul flight over the Atlantic without preserving that data. What the FAA is now looking for is requiring that any new cockpit voice recorders have enough capacity for at least 25 hours of audio. This would bring them in line with the requirements of the other black box, the flight data recorder, and it would also allow the investigator to get a much better idea of any distractions or other factors that might be common in these type of events. And obviously, the storage capability is no longer an issue with today's technology. It's also worth pointing out here that there have been in-flight incidents or accidents where preserving the CVR was a factor in the pilot's decision making, even before landing. In the case of an Air France Airbus A380 that lost an engine over the Atlantic in 2017, a crew member had to leave the cockpit to find a circuit breaker because they would land at the diversion airport just over two hours after their engine failure and they wanted the whole incident to be preserved. Honestly, that is a distraction that we really don't need in a scenario like that. So I am all for this extension of the recording time. 
Finally, these events have renewed calls for pilots to maintain their manual flying skills, also causing many to accuse either the FAA or the airlines of ignoring basic stick and rudder skills. And this is what some commentators are grabbing onto when they talk about woke pilots and airlines ignoring skills in favor of other factors in the hiring process. Now, to those of you out there who actually think that woke pilots is a problem, I have some great news for you. They're not, and I'll tell you why very soon. When it comes to the recent guidance issued by the FAA about the need for airlines to encourage pilots to maintain their hand flying skills, I am all for it. It is crucially important that pilots are skilled in both manipulating the automatics of a modern airliner and flying it completely manually if the need should arise. During the last couple of decades, as the automatics have improved, the emphasis might have sometimes fallen too far towards the automation side, and the flying skills might have been a little too little emphasized. The guidance that the FAA has recently sent out to operators aim to highlight this fact and to give airlines a push towards practicing more hand flying, but here I also have a few words of caution. Hand flying an aircraft with passengers on board can be done, but only after a careful briefing so that both pilots are fully prepared for what's about to happen. It should be done in appropriate weather into airports the pilots are familiar with and with low traffic density away from terrain. A proper threat and error management brief should be done before and the briefing should include how to return to automatic flight if the need should arise. So why is that so important then? Well, most automatic systems are built to be a huge help in lowering stress and workload levels, increasing situational awareness and navigational accuracy. If we decide not to use those systems with passengers on board, we need to make absolutely sure that the safety margins are maintained and that we don't just dive into a manual raw data approach without the other pilot being fully aware and prepared for it. Many accidents and incidents have been caused by the mismanagement of hand flying and this is why I personally am a proponent of keeping complicated hand flying training inside the simulators and at least always keep the flight directors working when hand flying the actual aircraft online. Because what we don't want is for these recent incidents to be replaced with many more new ones caused by bad preparations and poor judgment. This recent guidance from the FAA is nothing really new, by the way. They have been actively pushing for more hand flying practice since at least back in 2016. Now, as for airlines choosing so called Vogue pilots, uh, I don't really know what to say, but what I can say is that I have been involved in flight training for the last 17 years of my career. When new pilots join an airline, what we want to see is that they have the skills and the competence that they need, that they respond well to training, and that they are people who can work well with others, including pilots, cabin crew, dispatchers, and everyone else. The color of their skin, their social and personal preferences, gender, or their politics should have absolutely nothing to do with that. A company can of course have goals of reaching for diversity or equality in the workplace because the industry famously only employs about 5% of female pilots for example, but that goal will always come after the proper competencies and skills have been confirmed, never before. Anything else would be absolutely crazy in an industry which is so dependent on safety and the confidence of the traveling public. Now, since this video is about aviation incidents, I want to give a huge shout out to Simon Radecki, who runs the Aviation Herald. You should definitely check out that website if you're interested in the details of these type of events. I'll link to it here in the description below. In an interview he gave a couple of years ago, Simon made a really good point that I'm going to paraphrase here. Don't be afraid to fly in places where there are a lot of aviation incident reports. The places you should probably worry about are those where there are no reports until something really bad happens. That's really worth remembering here. The fact that you hear a lot about incidents in the United States right now is because of the high safety standards that the US authorities and operators are used to, and the fact that they react immediately if they start to even get a small whiff of a negative trend. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.